Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Algis Kalukas, and once again, it's my pleasure to welcome one and all to our free monthly virtual Watt Talks series. For anyone new, WHAT stands for Waterside Hypotheses or Aquatic Theories or whatever you like. If you look at the logo closely, you'll, you'll get the idea. In a nutshell, uh, they propose that the many peculiar physical differences between humans and chimpanzees are most plausibly explained by a more aquatic past in our evolution. This is the 11th talk in the series now, and like all the previous 10, it'll be recorded and the video will be put online at our website, www.whattalks.com and the associated YouTube channel. Now, until today, all of our guest speakers have more or less been supporters of waterside models of human evolution. The same can be said, I think, for most of the people who have joined our meetings live. But obviously, I've little idea of the opinions of those watching the 1,300 or so views of our videos that we've had on our channel. Of course, there's an obvious danger here. It's this thing called confirmation bias. Could it be that we've just been egging each other on, telling ourselves what we want to hear? In the world of social media, I think it's called a filter bubble. In today's ever more polarized world, shouldn't we be seeking to leave our comfort zone sometimes and challenge our previously held notions? I think it's the intellectually moral thing to do anyway. I had a recent email exchange on this very question with Vernon Reynolds, the famous primatologist who was given the unenviable task of chairing the 1987 Volkenberg uh, Symposium entitled Aquatic Ape Factual Fiction and the published proceedings in the blue tone, which is commonly now referred to as Rodital. Uh, this was the first scientific symposium on the subject and remains today, 35 years later, the only real attempt to look at these ideas in a fair and balanced way. It was Vernon's carefully chosen words in his concluding paragraph which attracted my attention. Basically, he said that although he didn't think it correct to designate our early hominid ancestors as aquatic, he, uh, that he did think that there was ev evidence that moving through water may have acted as an agency of selection in our evolution. It was this common sense middle of the road wording that Elaine and I used in our attempt to define waterside hypotheses in 2011. So when Vernon and I were discussing our What Talks program, he encouraged me to try to find a future guest speaker who was skeptical about the aquatic ape theory and not just yet another proponent to add to an ever increasing list. Clearly, we needed a mainstream aquasceptic. Now, I can't think of anyone who fits that bill better than today's guest speaker, John Langdon, Professor Emeritus of Biology and Anthropology at the University of Indianapolis. He is the author of six books on human evolution, including one that will be published in, by Springer uh, next month. I've put a potted bio of him on the website. Now, John is very rare in the field, in the field that he's in, in that he actually takes the time and trouble to respond to those of us who think Elaine Morgan might have been onto something. Most of his peers don't think it's even worth the bother of a rebuttal. They tend to ignore emails and block you on Twitter. It was John who wrote the first serious attempt to critique the so-called aquatic ape uh, hypothesis in a, in a specialist scientific journal, the now famous Umbrella Parsimony paper published in the Journal of Human Evolution, the JHE in 1997. Better late than never, I suppose. This was, remember, almost 40 years after Hardy's paper, Was Man More Aquatic in the Past, uh, was printed in New Scientist. But credit to John for at least recognizing that some response was long overdue. As he wrote in that paper, thus the aquatic ape continues to be encountered by puzzled students who wonder why mainstream paleoanthropologists overlook it. If only because of this last audience, it should not be ignored. Well, I was wondering the same thing myself at about the same time. So I returned to academia to start a master's degree in human evolution at University College London. And on day one there, there was a kind of welcome party. 
so students and tutors could get to know each other a bit. The head of department at the time was Leslie Aiello, so I couldn't resist asking her what's wrong with this aquatic ape theory. She was editor of the JHE at the time and immediately suggested I read John Langdon's paper. But her confident expression dropped visibly when I told her I'd not only read it, but I'd written a counter critique. I'm sure John would like to say a few words maybe about that. Uh, anyway, in the, the first time I met John was in 2009 in Chicago at the annual meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. I'd just given my talk called something like Troubling the Waters of Anthropology in a hall full of maybe 200 main, mainstream anthropologists. I think I did OK, but it did feel a bit like going into the proverbial lion's den. After a series of pretty hostile questions, I sat down with great relief. Within seconds, I heard a friendly voice next to me. That was a very brave thing to do. It was John. Uh, I had a good chat uh, with him for a while afterwards before we went our separate ways. Since then, John and I have had many exchanges of opinion on these matters, culminating in an unpublished paper where we both try to discuss the subject courteously and fairly using the same language. I'll put a link to it on our website, along with references to some of John's papers on the subject and that link to the video I gave, uh, the talk I gave in Chicago. So I'm under no illusions here. I know John is going to be giving an opposing view to mine, and I suspect most of those of us listening. But that's good, isn't it? I personally find the response to Elaine Morgan's work from academia almost as fascinating as the ideas themselves. The fact that so many mainstream anthropologists refuse to engage with us at all, treating the whole thing as pseudoscience is incredible to me. So today we get a rare chance to actually hear some of the reasons for this scepticism, to be able to challenge them, and then to discuss these matters uh, openly and fairly. I think it's greatly to John's credit and intellectually and morally very courageous that he agreed to do this. John chose to record his presentation and send me the video rather than give the talk live. So I'm going to ask John if he wants to say a few words beforehand, but then I'm going to then play the video of this talk, which will last for about 35 minutes. After that, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. OK, enough of me. So, John, do you want to say a few words or do you want to go straight into the talk? Actually, I would like to say a few words. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and welcome to all of you. Um, I first started looking at this at the aquatic model seriously because of my students would come up and occasionally uh, ask me about it. And I thought they deserved a real response. I've gotten several comments back about my original umbrella paper and later ones, um, some of them more thoughtful than others. If you were to go back and read it carefully, um, in that paper and later ones and today's talk, I'm not saying you're wrong and I'm right. What I'm trying to do is look at how do we formulate and test scientific hypotheses. I believe that it's impossible to, to fully test and certainly not prove um, any model of why we evolved the way we did from the past. We simply don't have enough information and never will. Um, and that's one of the points I'd like to argue in this. I tend to try to, I try to keep it narrowly focused on the question of bipedalism uh, because in a conversation I had with Elaine Morgan, she said she thought that was the crux of her argument and I'll just obviously follows in suit with that. Um, so, I know, I know from talking to other people um, that there are different views on aquatic models and different emphases, and I, it's impossible to address all of them. So bearing that in mind, um, please uh, watch the, the video I made and uh, look at my arguments for uh, why I don't think uh, this is the best model. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Well, again, again, thank you very much for, for uh, not only doing the talk, but also being here to to uh, sort of answer questions on it. It's very kind of you. Now, uh, over to John Langdon uh, for his talk, Waving or Waddling, We Need Good Questions to Get Good Answers. So I'm going to call this talk Waiting or Waddling. Um, and to anticipate the fact that I'm may or may not give you a good answer, I will ask, add the subtitle, we need good questions to get good answers. 
Um, yes, I am the aqua skeptic, as um, August has referred to me, and uh, I, I guess I appear that way in the Wikipedia article on the aquatic ape. I'm going to speak from the standpoint of the orthodox anthropologist, uh, and the, the response to aquatic ape theory has been mostly quiet. Um, I first encountered Hardy's article back when I was a student, and honestly, I read it and thought it was a joke. A few years later, I read Elaine Morgan's first book, The Descent of Women, and decided it was not really worth considering. And most anthropologists took that view, which is why there was pretty deadly silence for a few, for a couple of decades. Um, I decided to wade into the subject when I was receiving several questions from my students who were asking about it because they didn't know very much about it and didn't know um, how to take it. Um, since that time, the aquatic ape hypothesis, and I'll call it a hypothesis, it's not a theory, has evolved. Um, the original version had two dramatic habitat shifts from land to sea, from sea back to land, uh, which seemed to make it that much more improbable. But uh, since the 1960s, there are now a diverse, uh, diversity of variations on the aquatic gate model. Um, and they range from one extreme, Mark Verhagen, who you'll, you'll hear from in another one of these talks, uh, saying that we are the aquatic ape, that apes in general are aquatic adapted species. And uh, on the other, you've got uh, a really scaled down model, such as that uh, supported by August Koliukas, um, his waiting hypothesis, which has taken most of the components of swimming and diving um, out of the model and really focused on, on waiting. Are we aquatic apes now? I'm going to dispense with this question very quickly. Uh, my answer most certainly is in the negative. Um, and if we want to discuss it further, we're going to have to really look at that definition of what does it mean to be aquatic. But for most people, um, there is no serious life threat, life dependent uh, relationship with the water. So what's at the core of the aquatic ape hypothesis? Where do we want to focus our attention? At a conference years ago in Belgium, um, I pointed out that of the many different parts of our anatomy that seem to be correlated with aquatic life, um, they begin to appear in the fossil record at really different times. And so the original brief period of being in the water coming back out, envisioned by Elaine Morgan, um, was sort of stretching out across millions of years and, and most of the human fossil record. So I asked her point blank, when did the uh, aquatic period happen and what would you like it to explain? And she, and she thought for a second and answered very clearly, bipedalism, um, that if the aquatic ape model explains anything, it's going to be why we're bipedal. So I'm going to focus on that question. It is, after all, the focus that, that August has, and it's the focus that I had in my dissertation um, and have been doing a lot of thinking about it ever since. Elaine's question, um, as she made more explicit in some of her later books, and it was the same one asked by a lot of anthropologists over the years. Why did our ancestors change from being normal quadrupeds to slow, ungainly bipeds? And I'm going to answer, that's the wrong question. To really understand what happened, we need to change the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about our ancestors, and the way we think about terrestrial vertebrates and their locomotion in general. Human species is not as special as we generally think. That's a theme that I'm going to be returning to in this talk. We don't need extraordinary events such as becoming temporarily aquatic to explain who we are, where we got to here today. The second theme is um, becoming bipedal is not a revolutionary event. It has evolved many times. It was a process, not a single event. So it's not going to be a single reason to it um, if, you're, if it takes you a couple million years to become bipedal, 
then the selective pressures are probably going to be changing uh, throughout that period, and uh, um, we shouldn't be looking for simplistic explanations. Unlike uh, Morgan's or Elaine's implication in her book, the alternative to bipedalism is not the quadrupedalism we normally think of as we look around at other animals. Fast, uh, efficient, um, exemplified by the antelope in this picture, think about a cheetah running across the ground or a horse. Elaine put together a false dichotomy, bipedal or running, and uh, it simply doesn't exist. Let's go back to our early ancestors to really explore this. The first tetrapods, the first fish-like animals that developed four legs, four feet, um, were still in the water. They were using their feet probably to push off the bottom. And uh, they pretty much swam like fish. They swept their tail back and forth, side to side, to push themselves forward. Um, swimming locomotion involved lateral flexion of the spine, musculature of the entire body. Once their descendants came out on land, they maintained that same basic motor pattern. Uh, here's a salamander um, caught in several positions as it walks. When it take a, takes a step, the entire spine flexes from one side to the other. Individual limbs are sticking uncomfortably out of the side, so it's constantly doing push-ups. Um, but they have a very restricted range of motion. They can't take big steps. The only way to increase the stride length, to move a little faster, is to do a lot more um, flexion of that spine, which involves the muscles of the entire body wall. It also puts a lot of constriction on one side of the thorax and then the other side, which pushes air back and forth between them. So they really can't breathe while they're walking this way. Um, so it's inefficient. It uh, cuts against any kind of, kind of endurance. And to get out of this, other animals, their descendants, had to come up with better ways of moving around. One solution discovered by the archosaurs, the ancestors of the dinosaurs, was to become bipedal. And by doing so, they were able to pick up speed. And very quickly, the dinosaur ancestors became the dominant uh, land predators of the day because they were fast. Um, what they accomplished was to totally disengage the front limbs from locomotion. They balanced the body on the pelvis, developing an oversized tail as a counterweight to the front part of the body. Um, they had to lighten the front part of the body, so the front limbs got very reduced, especially in something like T-Rex here. Um, and I suspect the reduction of the front limbs was exaggerated because the weight of the head was exaggerated. But now they've got rear wheel drive only. And they're pushing forward the spine of the body like a javelin running flying forward. But if that javelin bends, it's not going to go anywhere. So they also had to stiffen and almost immobilize the whole trunk anterior to the pelvis. And some of the dinosaurs, like the hadrosaurs, actually fused those bones together with uh, these long ossified tendons that uh, made it impossible to, to flex the spine there. They also lost a lot of agility. Um, T-Rex and others don't have very much in the way of abductors. So to, to change direction, they pretty much have to rely on one foot moving faster than the other, or taking bigger steps than the other, which gives them a surprisingly large um, turning radius. Nonetheless, it was successful um, at their time, and the bipedal ancestor diversified into all the dinosaurs we have on record. I circled the bipedal forms in this particular phylogeny to show you that it was um, the ornithischians as well as the saurischians used this strategy. Um, later on, a few dinosaurs became secondarily quadrupedal because they got really big, like the um, brontosaurus, titanosaurus, or they got really heavy, like ankylosaur with all of its armor, or they got really heavy heads, like the ceratopsians. But most are bipedal. And later strategies, as they became more efficient, made the bodies a little bit more compact and began to shift them to a more upright balance. 
Um, and that's the pattern that uh, their descendants, the birds, carry over today. Kangaroos found the same solution independently, uh, balancing the, the whole body on the pelvis with a sizable tail that helps to, as a counterweight to the head, reducing those forelimbs and, and not engaging them in anything but the slowest locomotion. Um, and I suspect the uh, kangaroos did it for the same reasons as the dinosaurs. It was a quick way to speed up because they had no good quadrupedal alternative. Uh, marsupials never developed fast running gallop. Uh, when you look at the two major ecosystems in which the marsupials were a part, um, in Australia and South America, the, the, the herds or flocks of grazers are kangaroos in Australia or a placental group, the notoungulates, in, um, in South America because the other mode of locomotion for marsupials wasn't effective in open country. The top predators in South America were terror birds, and the top predators in Australia were actually lizards, the varanid lizards. So they did not have the same solutions that placental mammals did. So let's go back to the origin of mammals and say, well, why do they have such limitations in their locomotion? How did these earliest mammals get around? And the answer is they climbed. Um, they were small, many of them lived in burrows, a few lived in trees. But imagine yourself a Mesozoic mammal, crawls out of your burrow in the morning, you're about the size of a rat or so, and the first thing you see is this pile of dirt that you created when you dug your, your burrow, and it's as tall as you are, so you have to climb over it. If you live in a riverbank like the one depicted here, you're climbing a hillside, which could be more like going up a mountain. Uh, even a creek bed could look like a, a, a small canyon to you. If you go into a bush, you're climbing. Go into stiff grass, you're climbing. Um, to do that, you need a lot of agility. You need uh, grasping limbs or, or some clawing limbs or something to give you a grip. Um, but every step you take is going to have a different orientation, so it's one step at a time. So what is normal quadrupedalism? Most mammals are small, so they have a scrambling irregular gait that adjusts each step to the substrate. Relatively few of them evolved to be large enough that they could run. Running involves a relatively flat surface, fairly um, uniform so you know where your foot's going to come down well, when you're moving at any kind of a speed. And for the surface to be flat, you have to be a big animal. If we look over the variety of mammalian orders, um, most of these are small, a couple exceptions like elephants and so forth, but most of them never learned how to run. Some of them hopped, some of them swam, some of them flew, but most never really learned how to run. So when we think of conventional runners, the, the galloping horses and so forth, um, it's just this small group down here, uh, which would include the Artiodactyls, um, deer, sheep, antelope, the uh, prosodactyls like the horses, and the carnivores, think cheetahs and lions and tigers. Um, so we have just one small division of the mammals that developed the anatomical features necessary to really run. Why is this important? Because bipedalism appears extraordinarily um, only when a better option is available. And it wasn't. Primates don't belong to this group. Primates didn't have the option of being good runners. Primates just specialized to climb trees. They picked up a few extra features, like they sit upright, um, they have grasping hands. <coughs> These proved extremely useful when we became bipedal later on. They didn't really have anything to do with becoming bipedal at the time. As they increased in body size, climbing around in trees became a little bit more of a challenge. So by the time you get to be a medium-sized monkey, um, if you, most of your food is out on the peripheral branches of the trees that are kind of weak fruit, uh, new leaves and so forth. 
So if you try to crawl out there on top of the branches, they tend to sag under your weight and want to throw you off. The safer way to do it is to hang on the underside of the branches, and then you've got hands and feet and maybe a prehensile tail to grasp multiple supports with um, while you choose your dinner. So the New World monkeys and the colubines are what we call below branch feeders. Just one group, um, the Circopithecine monkeys in the Old World, are above, stay above branch feeders. And they perhaps went uh, uh, secondarily or secondarily adapted back to the ground and uh, remain kind of quasi terrestrial arboreal. At least that's John Napier's interpretation. Um, the apes, though, being larger bodied than, than monkeys these days, uh, all are below branch feeders. And to do that effectively and to climb effectively, they reorganize the body um, in particular ways. The upper limbs are used for grasping, for hanging, for hoisting the body upward, pulling upward. Um, so they load in tension. The trunk is typically upright, and the lower limbs are weight-bearing, supporting the trunk underneath. Well, these characteristics of the um, upper limbs used in overhead movements, trunk upright and the lower limbs weight-bearing, of course, describes bipedalism. Asian apes, when they come to the ground, are typically really awkward. Um, the gibbon, shown on the right, has arms that are too long to be an effective walker, so it walks bipedally. Uh, because the limbs just don't coordinate together. Um, it can't even push off with its long toes, so it, uh, it takes only very small mincing steps, or I've even seen uh, Gibbons trying to speed up a little bit by running sideways. The orangutan on the left, and we're looking at just a juvenile, um, also has a very awkward and uh, highly variable gait pattern. Look at the way the hand comes down to the ground. It's kind of sideways. The wrist joints and ankle joints of apes typically are extremely mobile. They have to be because the supports in the trees they're going to grab a hold of are very uh, unpredictable. And because they're, they're, the joints are so mobile, then they're also unstable. They can't really handle a lot of weight and forces passing through them. Um, they don't come down for the orangutan in a very systematic way leaving them awkward, leaving them really unable to establish any kind of a, a running um, or fast gait. African apes did find a specialized way to get around on the ground. They developed knuckle walking. Chimps, bonobos, and gorillas um, all are knuckle walkers. Gorillas and the, and the chimps are uh, apparently developed this independently of one another. It allows them to maintain long fingers they need to grasp um, but they had to go back and reinforce the joints of the fingers and the wrist and the elbow so they could bear weight and, and handle some forces. They're not terribly efficient. Uh, they can't uh, maintain, they can't be very fast for long periods of time. Um, so there, there are some limitations, but it does allow at least the chimps and bonobos to maintain a fairly arboreal life. Well, gorillas are stuck on the ground mostly because of their large body mass. So if we look for another alternative, if you're a, a climber with these long arms and, and so forth, bipedalism is an option. And that, obvi that obviously is what our ancestors did when they came down to the ground. But the apes are already set up for it. So it, it's not a real mystery why at least some of them coming to the ground became bipeds. In fact, they became bipeds in the trees. We know that Australopithecines were still partly arboreal. Their bodies contained a mixture of bipedal and climbing characteristics and had that mix for a couple million years. This was not a, a very brief transitional period for our ancestors. Uh, so they must have developed the bipedality in the trees where you can commonly see chimpanzees and bonobos walking by or standing bipedally in the trees today. When they did come down to the ground, it would just be a matter of 
selection to uh, fine tune the body for greater efficiency. But that came later. Um, bipedals was such an obvious adaptation for climbing hominoids that several species took that step. Uh, we have for this, this example, the um, genus Danuvius, an 11 million year old hominoid from Germany. Uh, this would be middle Miocene. Um, just published a couple of years ago, it had suspensory upper limbs, telling us that yeah, it's still actively in the trees. But the lower limbs, oddly, are have fully extensible joints. So it could walk around with a fully extended knee, a fully extended hip, something none of the living apes, and not even Australopithecus, was able to accomplish. Um, that tells us it did habitually stand, if not walk around um, upright on two limbs. Oreopithecus has been known for some time from some nearly complete skeletons in Italy. Uh, it's a smaller body, more closer to gibbon size. Really, really long upper limbs, again, for suspension, possibly arm swinging. Um, and a surprisingly short pelvis, which suggests strongly that it was adapting to a more upright posture and bipedal um, way of walking. Uh, lower limbs and, and the trunk relatively small and compact, um, like some of our apes today. From Crete, six million years ago, at a site called Trachilos, we have these footprints. Uh, we don't know who made them, no idea what the species was. The, the footprints have some characteristics with those of a chimp and some a little more human-like in the in narrow heel. But um, what we can say for certain is there was a bipedal species walking around on the island of Crete. Going to Africa, the first hominin that we know much about was Ardipithecus, um, which was around for a couple million years. And we have a couple partial skeletons that tell us a lot about its body form. Um, the short pelvis again suggests bipedalism. Also, the toes hyperextend, something that ape toes don't typically do, but is a good signifier of bipedal walking. Um, it also has relatively short upper limbs, about the same length as the lower, but based on the forearm, as you can see. Um, and weird wrist joint, which led Owen Lovejoy to reconstruct the locomotion for Ardipithecus as palmigrade arborealism, that is walking along the top of the branch with the palm flat on the ground, well, bipedal on the ground. Okay, um, I th think to fully understand what Ardipithecus was doing, we're going to need uh, more time, more studies, and more, hopefully more fossils um, to put this together into something comprehensible. But right now, it makes a really poor ancestor for Australopithecus. And Australopithecus, which um, overlapped with uh, Ardipithecus for half a million years, would then be an independent derivation of bipedalism. There were lots of Australopithecine species. We have a two million year long fossil record for them. Um, there was a lot of diversity. We know that the East African uh, species seem to be a little more terrestrially adapted. The South African was a little more arboreal based on um, features of the foot like an opposable hallux, features of the hand like uh, long curved fingers, slightly, and, and the limb proportions a lot longer uh, disproportion between the upper limb and lower limb in the South African species. And during this time, they lived in a variety of habitats, um, some degree of woodland mixed with varying amounts of more open country. Um, so the, ha the habitat was changing out from under them. So they're not all kind of stuck in, in just a forest or, or any one type of place to live. So um, what I've tried to argue is there are at least five different derivations of bipedalism from the hominoids. The aquatic ape model, especially the uh, wading ape hypothesis, states that um, we became bipedal because our ancestors needed to wade 
for aquatic resources. So did the survival of Australopithecines depend on waiting? And I put the word survival in there because if they didn't, then selection's not going to act on them to, to make them more effective waiters. Um, there has to be a considerable amount of selective pressure to redesign the body in all the ways that it's been reshaped for it to be a bipedal. And the fact that the that so many different lineages turn out to be bipedal independently of one another strongly suggests that it doesn't take a lot of a pushing to make an animal bipedal. All it needs to do is need to be more efficient on the ground. Maybe a little bit faster, maybe it'll have more endurance getting from one tree to the next. In other words, becoming bipedal was not revolutionary. It emerged when efficient quadrupedalism was not an option, or, or at least would have required at least as much of an overhaul of the body design as to become bipedal. It emerged in hominoids that already had many of the necessary traits, the weight supporting the lower limb and the erect trunk posture. This bipedalism emerged organically out of these preconditions. And so humans in this regard weren't quite as special as we tend to think. It wasn't um, a, real, a real hurdle or a real surprise to become bipedal. And if Algus wants to give me the rest of the series, I can elaborate on this and talk about why I don't think the brain size or the behavior or the tool use or the culture of hominins is quite as, uh, of humans is quite as special as we generally think it is too. It doesn't require any special explanations either. And bipedalism was not a single evolutionary event. It was an extended process over a long period of time. And if we think about all the ways that uh, happy hands free might enhance our lives, might enhance our, our um, fitness in a Darwinian sense, then we shouldn't expect there to be a single explanation why our ancestors over several million years developed and improved upon bipedalism. This is the way, the, the model that um, not just the aquatic ape uh, hypothesis would describe the origin of bipedalism, but the way all anthropologists did up until, say, the 1970s, um, that there was a smooth transition from early hominin to an intermediate feature in Australopithecus to modern Homo. And the early interpretations of the skeletons of, of uh, Australopithecus, like Lucy, really tried to force her into an, an inter intermediate role, something between a chimp and a human. During the 1980s, that was questioned and uh, with a lot of very vocal and mostly friendly, but not always, argument, uh, we began to appreciate there were at least two distinct and stable phases to this development of bipedalism because the Australopiths turned out to be a stable, um, successful model for body design. So we have the first switch over from early hominins to bipedal Australopiths, which had retained a, a mixed use of arboreal and terrestrial resources and habitats. And then a second transition a couple million years later to humans, where we developed a more efficient striding gait with longer limbs, greater endurance and speed, um, and a more complete adaptation to terrestrial life. So two evolutionary events are required here. Two explanations are required because the contexts are very different. Two discontinuous changes as we follow our lineage through. And we now know that at each of these um, two new phases, there was more diversity than we expected. So here's my current model. Um, from early hominins, we have the Ardipithecus group splitting off early on, very specialized form of, of probably more arboreal-ism than terrestrialism, although um, they were living in a mixed country with a significant open, open country component. And then we have the Australopithecines with their diversity. We have the, the more arboreal group in the south of Africa, 
with uh, Prometheus and Africanus and Sediba. And up in East Africa, we have Afarensis, which is our best candidate as the ancestor of Homo for a variety of reasons. A little bit more terrestrial, um, and then leading soon after to the Erectines and the Hobbelines. So right within the early genus Homo, we have a split. Um, we don't have a really good handle on the hobbeline postcranial anatomy or the way they, they moved around. We have uh, fragments and a couple of partial skeletons in poor condition uh, that suggest they were significantly different from the erectines, maybe more primitive, maybe more arboreal, but we'd love to see better material because there's still controversy over this. But by the time you get to the erectines, especially the, the nericotomy skeleton about uh, 1.5 million years ago, they look enough like us that we can say, aha, they walked like us. They were um, long-legged bipeds and just needed tinkering from then on to become modern humans. So where does this leave us? At the end of the day, and we're not quite at the end of the day yet, um, the aquatic ape is an origin story. Now, I don't say this to be totally dismissive. Origin stories are useful, they are universal in all different contexts. I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Um, but they're stories that tell us who we are. The stories that tell us even more than who we are, who we'd like to be, how we'd like to think of ourselves. And so as we put together origin stories, we're very selective in the material and the plot line and the characters. Um, Elaine Morgan, in selecting her origin story, chose to emphasize the role of women. It was an early feminist perspective. It was an explicit rejection of some of the male-oriented origin stories, such as African Genesis and Man the Hunter. For Raymond Dart and his publicizer, Robert Ardrey, humans were nasty, savage, bloodthirsty killers. The killer ape comes out of this. Uh, but they had witnessed two world wars and the beginning of the Cold War and the Holocaust, and uh, all the optimism of the Victorian age had evaporated. So that's how they chose to depict us, and it's carried on well in popular culture. Man the Hunter, um, put together by Lee and DeFore, emphasized hunting. It's kind of killing, carrying over some of that killing, although it focuses more on animals than other people. But they also were studying hunter-gatherers, so they used the hunters as a model of life. Why they had to be so male-oriented, eh, that's a question that we can decide. It was in the air at the time. Um, but they too were pretty selective about the data they used to support their model, including ignoring women. What these origin stories have in common is there's something special happening, something unique that sets us on the path to being humans, a fork in the road or whatever, or then a miracle occurs. We have other sources of origin stories. We have the biblical stories, which have a supernatural um, intervention to help define who we are. We have national origin stories. Um, the American national origin story involves the, the revolution and the pilgrims. And we're currently trying to rewrite it because the authors of this story were very selective. They were white and male and, and kind of focused on that. And now we are, as a nation, rethinking the, the role of slavery and the contributions of immigrants and African Americans um, as we try to rethink who we are. Australia has its origin story, the First Fleet bringing hundreds of convicts as they begin to found the colony. Um, originally, you didn't want to be the, the descendant of a convict, but I understand the attitudes are changing now and people are building their genealogies with pride to get back to these early settlers. We can have scientific origin stories like Darwin's Descent of Man or Desmond Morris's Naked Ape. Again, kind of pulling out what they think is important about humans. For Darwin, it was um, tool using. It was technology. 
for Desmoris, it was sex, but then he was writing during the outbreak of the sexual revolution. Um, Lucy is an origin story. Uh, and e. Wilson uh, uh, took his sociobiology and made it into human origin story as we as they went about selectively choosing arguments and evidence to build their vision of what makes humans. But origin stories are everywhere. They're in the myths we may or may not enjoy reading. They're in literature, um, straight out fiction like the Just So stories. Uh, so many cultures around the world have their own origin story, which may exist as an epic or a, a saga or a poem. Um, and then as you delve more deeply into less mainstream cultures, you find, again, they have their own origin stories. And some origin stories are just straight out misinformation. Okay. Here's one of my favorites. Um, it's the opening scene from the movie 2001. And bonus points for anybody who can identify the anthropologist who trained the actress who played Australopithecines in this scene. Okay. So, to bring this to a conclusion, why are we bipedal is not a good question. It's not going to give us a nice, simple, pat answers we look for because it's not a simple story. And what do we make of the aquatic ape hypothesis? It's just another story. We have lots of those stories. Um, so I ask, is that what science is really looking for? And final word, the answer to my question, it was Philip Tobias who trained the Australopithecines in the movie 2001. Good day to you all. I would be happy to participate in any discussion. Okay, well, thank, thanks very much, John. That, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I, I feel a bit of a, a cheat here because I've obviously had this video for a while and I have watched it a couple of times, so I'm probably better prepared than anyone else. So I, I'm going to take that opportunity to make a, a single point and ask a question, and then I'm going to throw it open to everyone uh, if, if anyone has a question or a point that they would like to make. So I'm just going to start. I just want to make a point about... Um, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the business of uh, origin stories, uh, but I just want to make a point about misunderstandings and straw man arguments. Now, it, it, it seems to me that what's been missing here from the start is the, uh, what Alistair R. Hardy said in his title of his paper, was man more aquatic in the past? And I think people have kind of ignored that word, word more and just I mean, it's very easy to satire, satirize this idea if you just think of it as saying that we're an aquatic ape and i think that no one really has ever said that i just think it's it's a little bit of a misrepresentation now in terms of mark's views and mine you kind of portrayed those as extreme and i don't think you're quite accurate in describing mark's view i don't think mark i mean unfortunately mark can't be here today but if he was here i'd, I'd I don't think he would say that we are the aquatic ape. I think it'd be fairer to say that he would say that Homo erectus was the most aquatic we ever were, and we've become less aquatic since then. And uh, about my model, I just have to sort of say, it's not so much that it's scaled down and I've taken out the components of swimming and diving. It's just that uh, what I try to do is to say, well, this isn't just one idea, there's a whole load of them. And uh, by the whole point of relabeling this whole thing, waterside hypotheses of human evolution in the plural, is that there's many ideas here, just like there's many mainstream ideas. And I just chose to look at the waning hypothesis first in isolation, because I think it's the most simple, plausible and evidence based one of the lot. But I think all of them are pretty good, and I, I certainly wouldn't discount wading and swimming, and all of the other, uh, and nearly all of the things that Elaine have said. So I think that's just not quite fair. Now, can, can uh, I respond? Uh, May I respond uh, to that a little bit? Yeah, on then, if you'd like to respond. 
I, I didn't mean to characterize your idea as extreme. I meant ends of the, of the spectrum as I see it. But I think Mark actually did say in emails I exchanged with him, we are aquatic. It is the modern human species. And Alistair Hardy, while he was saying more aquatic, he built his argument mostly on parallels with whales, and he was asking for it. Okay, well, that's that's. I think I think he did also say some other things that that mm -hmm. people should have taken as watering that down. The other thing I wanted to say is is about your question. I mean, the whole the whole of your talk is called is basically about asking the right question, and you said. That it, uh, you know, the question is why did our ancestors change from normal quadrupeds to becoming slow, ungainly bipeds? And I think it's a fair it's fair to say that Elaine certainly did ask that question for many years, and some of them, me included, followed in her footsteps in asking that question for a few years. Uh, but I think that you know, I think as you said in your talk, a lot of anthropologists did, and certainly mainstream textbooks have done that too, and in fact, yes. a lot of them still do even today. Uh, and 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 I think what's what was missing was that really Mark Verhagen is one of the few people who wasn't asking that question. And and long before anybody, I, as, far as the, the very few people I know, uh, having read the literature, were saying that the last common ancestor was already somewhat bipedal. But Mark was doing that long before Sahelanthropus and Orrin were discovered. And after the discovery of uh, Orrin and Sahanthropus, I changed my mind to Mark's view. And I think most of us in the aquatic ape community would agree with Mark that the last common ancestor was already somewhat bipedal uh, as a wading climbing ape. So the whole of your question really is kind of a bit of a straw man. It's kind of suggesting that we're arguing that we move, why do we're asking, why do we move from a biped uh, from a quadruped to a biped when in fact 20 years ago most of us was, were agreeing with mark uh, that the last common ancestor was already a wading climbing ape so that the question doesn't really arise and i would say that the, uh, the modern anthropologists are, are behind the, uh, the the curve on this so if we want to have a good question here's a good question uh, assuming that the last common ancestor was already somewhat bipedal and you know, we would say wading, climbing, but somewhat bipedal. And assuming that the balio habitats of the early hominids are largely wetlands uh, or wet, Hadar, where uh, Lucis Hadar was a wetland for a million years. Sahelanthropus was in the middle of Paleo Lake Chad. You mentioned Danuvius. Danuvius was a river system. 80% uh, of the fossil hom uh, the faunal assemblage that was discovered with Danuvius were turtles. Uh, Oreopithecus was a swamp. I mean, the list goes on. And most importantly for me, the behavioral context of extant apes. Um, if, you know, you said, well, what scenario are they most likely to be bipedal with unsupported limbs indefinitely? It has to be in waist deep water. Now, if those three things are true, and I think they are, why don't anthropologists look at uh, wading as even a possibility why is it still treated like the plague that's my question okay um first of all anthropologists haven't been fully behind the idea of the common ancestor being bipedal or have, haven't come to that recently uh one of the papers that i found most influential was published in 1974 by john flegel pointing out the parallels between bipedalism and uh and climbing in terms of limb use, in terms of muscle use and so forth. Um, beginning of a whole series of EMG studies by Stony Brook Group, uh, further developing that idea. So for at least since the six, 70s and probably earlier, people were thinking about how e easily um, climbing transitions to bipedalism. So uh, certainly that we're talking before the common ancestor going back then. Um, but yeah, textbooks have been slow to uh, to emphasize that idea. Uh, as far as the watery habitats, um, I would say 90% of all vertebrate fossils come out of um, deposits that were created in water. That's how fossils get preserved, either that or in a cave. And we have plenty of hominins in caves in, down in South Africa. Uh, so if you want to, if you're a vertebrate and you want your bones preserved, 
hang around near water, die near water, and that increases your chances. So I would hazard to say all major bone deposits, if they aren't in a cave, are going to have, be found with aquatic animals. But the early hominids are also found with open country and arboreal animals, generally interpreted as gallery forests with mixed habitats nearby. It's difficult to pin them down to a single habitat. In fact, the common, the common element is not water. The common element is a mixture of habitats. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to hog the attention here. Would is somebody else like to ask a question? Malga, Malga do you want to go? And 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 any if anyone else wants to ask a question, please indicate and I'll put you in. Simon will be next. Okay, so Malga Jata, you go first. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I hope. Uh, thank you very much. This was very interesting uh, uh, and uh, very happy happy to be able to be here today. And uh, my comments may be a bit, uh, uh, you know, naive because I'm your humble translator, not a not a scientist. And uh, what I uh, like in particular, and I think I agree, uh, that these are origin stories, like the Audrey story, the, the Dart story, uh, Elaine story, uh, to a point. Uh, but I wouldn't think uh, that uh, questions about origins are not right questions. There are interesting questions. We are, I would say, as, a, as your humble translator, that we are a species to which narrate narratives are important and on the other hand i wouldn't think uh, that if something starts as an origin story it necessarily makes it bad or exclude uh, excludes uh, proper scientific inspiration and follow up and i would having said this i would echo um uh, argus's question why is wading or even swimming, the only thing absolutely excluded from consideration. Because, you know, we can have this story, but um, we have other stories which uh, make far more nonsense, like endurance running story. There is no support for this whatsoever. And no even uh, think, I mean, I cannot think of arguments that would validate uh, uh, endurance running story, but it's not excluded. It's, it's, you know, it's being considered serious. Somehow the waiting story is not. Myself, I think, but that's my particular, it's because of the feminist startup. And I think that's, this, may, uh, this is my hypothesis that this is the, that this is the kind of part of, big part of the resistance. But, Coming back to, to, to proper, um, uh, to right questions. Um, I, I say that uh, aquatic or water side or wading hypothesis uh, give a well, uh, interesting, reasonable hypothesis of what could be the gain of uh, bipedality why endurance running doesn't. And actually I don't know any other hypothesis that does. So what, so the right story would be, why did we become bipedal? It's still a valid question. And uh, you, the, the examples you, you gave, uh, as just as Argy said, we, we already, we don't consider that it's completely special. Uh, what I'm, what I am interesting is, why is this waiting completely impossible? What makes it impossible? We can see clearly that it, that it could be one of the options that would bring benefits to a bipedal mammal. So uh, I would think that's a valid question. So just wanted this comment, maybe some, you know, thoughts on this. Okay. As and you, and the, the origin story in particular. Okay. And my response is. Of course they were waiting, but they were doing lots of other things. And just like we wait sometimes, it was just one dimension of many aspects of their behavior. And I don't think it is likely we could single out any one behavior and say, this was the reason 
were becoming bipedal. They were probably bipedal when they first got out of the tree before they even hit the water. And that's my feeling. Um, so I, I just don't see that as, a, as an appropriate way to approach the question. I don't think there are answers to the question of a, of a single reason that drove bipedalism. No, no, I think I'm not so. asking about a single reason. I'm asking why single, when one single behavior is excluded from taking into consideration, from being taken into consideration. So um, it's inverse. Okay, I. Yeah, it's, it's hard no, to I speak know that you don't. for all yeah, anthropologists. You know. Yeah, I see it as, um, I say, just it's an aspect of walking around. If we get water, you wade, period. Uh, but that's not the same thing as saying the need to wade drove the um, early hominids to become bipedal or even more bipedal. That's not, now it becomes an emphasis on, well, how much time are you going to spend wading and so forth? Okay. Those are not questions we can answer easily. Thank, th thank you. That's that's. A, I think that's a, a, a fair question and a fair answer. I I, I just wanted to point out that, uh, to add to uh, Margaretta's point about uh, Dan Lieberman's endurance robbing hypothesis. I attended the Carter Symposium uh, last year, and seven out of eleven of the topics were at uh, the talks were in favour of the endurance robbing hypothesis. So I just think you know this point about it's not it doesn't seem to be uh even even handed okay S simon you, you you had your hand up first so simon please next and then bert please yes i think that any good hypothesis will float to the top if given the oxygen of publicity and this is where i see a huge disparity i like you john am an academic anthropologist and i've been one for over 40 years and my colleagues won't talk about the amphibious ape hypothesis or any autocide idea. And they seem to be biased against it. And I don't blame them because it's not mentioned in the textbooks. We need to be able to explain how we are different from an ape-like ancestor in every respect. There's lots of things that need re explaining. And I have read a lot of very convincing papers on why we are so different from a chimpanzee or a chimpanzee like ancestor and um, yet my colleagues won't read it at all they initially say well it's rubbish so i said well have you read about it well of course i haven't read about it it's rubbish and it's a, an entra entrenched view and it's reflected by the textbooks i have textbooks here in my office in that pile which never mention anything to do with naked or um, subcutaneous fat or differences in sweat glands or growing a bigger brain or changing the diet the teeth no mention is made of how we, be, we became different so i just wanted wanted to ask you don't, don't you find that at least embarrassing um i think there are reasons for that i think if you read my textbook human strategy which published years ago i do try to tackle that because it's really about anatomy but human evolution textbooks are not really about anatomy except bones maybe and it's not because anthropologists don't know or care about soft tissue body systems it's because the fossil record doesn't preserve them and therefore if you're talking about fossils, you've got bones to work with. If you're talking about other things, you're now dealing with an anatomy class. And for whatever reason, those are silos that aren't brought together in the same class very often. I've tried to do that um, in, my, in my textbook. Um, but I, I think there's, that's the reason why these, these topics really aren't brought together. I do think if you get into subcutaneous fat and sweat glands, and respiratory systems, as well as the biomechanics of the musculoskeletal system, there's a lot of argument to support endurance as a critical human adaptation. And I'm not really into endurance running as much, but endurance is something very special for humans. Um, it could be just long distance migration. I you know, don't need to draw any, any conclusions on that one. 
uh, St. John's Run. You know. I want to come back to that, come back on that, Simon, before I pass well, it, the question. It's just frustrating that it's, we're not playing on a level playing field. Very frustrating. I've, I've, I've had colleagues who fear that if they try to publish, they'll be blocked and they, their books are turned down or their articles are turned down. And others who fear that they won't get research grants. There's actually a fear and paranoia, I must say, because it does seem that there is a discrimination against people who speak up in support of these ideas. Um. I'm sorry, I, I just can't answer that. I, I've written a letter uh, recommending tenure for somebody who spent his time looking for Sasquatch. So I'm, I'm a little more open to ideas <laughs> than other people are. You are very unusual, John. <laughs> John you are unusual. He even talks to but us. So Algis, Algis points out that there's a book called The Encyclopedia of Human Evolution. And none of the authors of aquatic ideas or semi-aquatic ideas appear in that book. None of them are listed in the list of references. If you look up the index, nothing is mentioned about anything to do with um, living and thriving in water or near water. It's completely absent. And surely that 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 this this business about filtered bubble. I mean, we're in the filter bubble. We don't get no oxygen of publicity, and it's frustrating because it's very difficult to break through that barrier. And when and when uh, somebody like Sir David Attenborough gives a BBC documentary on it, you get people like Alice Roberts and uh, Mark Maslin criticise him as if he's a pseudoscientist. You know, that's the absurdity of it. Uh, OK, I want to go, go to Bert. I had to turn that. Yeah, uh, Bert, you've been waiting a while. So uh, let's let's uh, welcome to the group, Bert. It, it's, uh, this is your first time, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Join for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm Bert. Uh, actually, I've attended a the conference in London and uh, submitted a poster there. So I, my name was Chuck, and now I'm a researcher in artificial life and actually evolution, but uh, more in the co uh, computer science algorithms, something like that. So mm -hmm. I'm actually uh, keeping my interest in human evolution, uh, especially uh, aquatic uh, uh, water side uh, mm -hmm. versus endurance running, <laughs> you, you can say about that. And yeah, I, I, I just want to mention uh, the uh, Carter Symposium that yes, uh, as we see uh, in, this, in that symposium, uh, the majority of the uh, hypothesis or the talks are about running or uh, uh, the things uh, not about water, but uh, fortunately, there's a, a talk at the, at the uh, very end that talk about swimming, diving. Um, so I'm happy with that, actually. Um, it's more feel like uh, starting to have more balance. Uh, I'm happy with that. And so about endurance running, it seems like in the popular science uh, scenario, um, uh, it becomes a dominant uh, 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 theory or hypothesis that seems to be accepted by many uh, layman people that, oh, this is the, of course, this is the most uh, uh, reasonable reason for uh, many uh, things uh, that maybe makes us human. And so my question is, uh, if we this talk, we are talking about origin stories, right? And all, I always uh, going back to the umbrella hypothesis paper by John, that I think is a very good uh, uh, way to think about everything about uh, this kind of human evolution uh, hypothesis. So uh, um, about the endurance running hypothesis, how can we apply this kind of mindset on uh, that? group of thinking, that popular account. And also, in a, uh, the second question is, um, in a more general context, uh, if we want to uh, construct, construct a, over, a, a overarching uh, hypothesis or theory on human evolution, that is the origin story that we actually, I think uh, we should pursue. 
then um, what should we do? Like, um, it's not like in physics, we have uh, many uh, physicists, they think about the uh, uh, theory, of, theory of everything. Um, I want to see that in the study of human evolution, but it seems that um, any, uh, many uh, anthropologists, they, uh, uh, they are afraid of making this kind of overarching uh, umbrella hypothesis, but uh, always going to, uh, uh, I can say that reductionism, uh, like every trade is having uh, many kinds of uh, uh, reasons. And there's no, there's, maybe there should be no, uh, uh, like uh, a, a water site or uh, some other kind of um, over holistic reason. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. So, yeah. Your typical scientific journal, like Journal of Human Evolution, papers are, are data driven. They expect you to be collecting data to make a point and stop at the making that point. Trying to go from there to extrapolate into broader theories, that's not what they're looking for. And the reviewers will come down hard on somebody who's speculating beyond the narrow thing they're, they're assembling. There are very few journals that are interested in the big picture uh, origin story type of thing. Um, and the ones you do see published in mainline journals are coming from people with a long history of publication in that field. Uh, I think of Rick, Richard Rangham's paper on fire, which I refer to as the potato hypothesis, or Owen Lovejoy's Origin of Man, which I, I'm embarrassed about. Um, current anthropology is one of the few art journals that might uh, venture with such a paper, and they'll then bring in 20 reviewers to respond you know, sort of immediately in that same issue. But that's not what journals are interested in. They don't want speculation. They want um, facts and narrow, well-supported conclusions. Uh, and then they'll give you very little leeway to speculate on hypotheses beyond that. Uh, so that's why you don't see much of that. And so if you want to go on to your big picture, you publish a book. And uh, I, most of those books showed up in my list of origin stories or, or, or should have because that's what they are. And, and the thing wrong, the, the problem with origin stories is not that they're wrong, is that they become very subjective. It, it becomes a matter of, well, what do you think is the nature of humans? And other people will disagree with you. Um, Simon, you said something about good hypotheses should should float to the top but look at the history of anthropology we've had one hypothesis replaced by another one replaced by another one replaced by another one they do float to the top but it doesn't necessarily mean they're very good it's just the they fit the thinking at that particular moment in history i think what yes, we the, i think what we would say is that God, sorry simon you, you want to go no i was just going to say the, the ideas about Waterside ideas have not floated to the top because they've never been in the books in the first place. So they, they don't stand a chance. And yet, if they had been, they might have come to the top and proved very, very interesting indeed to a wide range of people. For example, my students are very supportive when they hear arguments for amphibious ape ideas, but they don't normally hear them from other people. Exactly. I mean, when John, when you said that you, when you first heard about the idea, you thought it was a joke. I mean, I, I, literally. I just yeah. think that uh, that's, that's because it's not been, you know, it, it, the word aquatic is a bit loaded and maybe people have just got the wrong end of the stick about that. If you read Hardy's paper quite carefully, he, he says that he, we were never more aquatic than an otter. So it's, it, I mean, that's not very aquatic. It's a semi-aquatic. And, and the mm -hmm. word more has been overlooked. It just seems to me it's been kind of misunderstood and then misrepresented as pseudoscience incorrectly. Uh, and I don't really, and it's become kind of um, a, a taboo subject, uh, like, like Simon says. Uh, now, uh, has anyone else got a question, a new one? Because I've got one from Francesca Mansfield, who normally is here, 
but for some reason she well, i know exactly why she's uh boating at the moment in in brief <laughs> so it's good one, for her but she's given me a question to read to you if i may uh, and uh, i'd like to you know just take this opportunity to, to, to read it to her so this is francesca's question to john she says okay we know we know that there are semi-aquatic birds uh, which are larger, fatter, bigger brained, heavier boned, more streamlined and have lost their pelage to, to some extent. We know that there are semi-aquatic and aquatic mammals uh, that have similar com uh, combinations of traits, such as losing their hair, larger brains, heavier bones and so on. So what physiological changes or morphological adaptations would you expect to see over the course of several million years if, and this is obviously a hypothetical question, if our ancestors had at any point since the early Miocene apes spent time frequently foraging and wa in water and in, uh, in, in the coastal habitats. So it's kind of putting it the other way around. If our ancestors had been aquatic, what would you expect to see as a difference between us and the apes? Interesting question. Um, one thing I found talking to different members of the aquatic community is how many different ideas there are out there and um, how difficult it is to talk generally with any one person before you find out that, oh, they're my, their idea is different. So one of the one of the most important issues is what exactly was that aquatic phase like? How how aquatic do you want our ancestors to be? Are they going to be more like a porpoise or more like an otter? Um, and depending on the answer to that question is how I would approach uh, Francesca's question. I would expect if if you're doing anything more than diving, uh, more than, sorry, anything more than wading, I would think we'd be much better at holding our breath much better at being able to stay under for longer periods of time, much more efficient at swimming than modern humans are today. And I know I've run across in, into arguments, um, and here's where the subjectivity of origin stories comes in, how, how good are humans today at swimming? I don't think we're very good compared to any animal that might be called aquatic or semi-aquatic. How good are we at holding our breath? Not very good, we drown darn easily. Um, sorry, Leslie, you have a question. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm a midwife, and uh, just hearing you say we don't we drown really easily. Um, well, I'd like to say we don't actually breastfeed very easily. That's because we've lost the skill, and it's not natural to us like it was even a hundred years ago. Never mind, you know, a thousand years ago. So I would say the same thing is probably true of not swimming quite so easily because we're not in the water quite as much as we might have been in the past. So we might have lost it to the same extent. And also, as a midwife, one thing that I see is during cesarean sections, the fat being stuck to the skin. And I don't see that in any other um, land mammal. And I'm really interested to know what your view is as to why we seem to have blubber rather than um fat stuck to the organs like apes do that's an easy one to answer um we have the same carolyn pond did research and published it at that uh, valkenberg symposium uh we have the same fat deposits as other mammals we just extend them more laterally so that they cover more consistently the subcutaneous portion of our skin with some conspicuous exceptions where fat's absent but why um where you find the fat is mostly in newborn babies, and secondly, in women of reproductive age. Um, not so much in males you now, and except in our hyper, hyper, hyper nutri nutritionally um, cursed uh, modern Western society. Um, why do babies need fat? It's to buffer a growing brain. That brain is demanding tremendous amounts of energy. You need to have a constant energy supply. And if the mother's um, a bit remiss in her timing for nursing, if her milk dries up, if the whole group uh, goes through a period of, of low nutrition, which is very possible in a, in a, in a uh, um, hunting gathering group where you have seasonal availability of food, 
then that infant needs to make sure that the supply to the brain is not going to be diminished. That but fat. Why, that, why, is it, why is it stuck to the skin rather than the organs? Why why is it more like blubber from a um, a more aquatic animal rather than a land based animal? That's well. That we do have fat uh, throughout the, our viscera, but that's the first place you put excess fat. The the, the yes. easy to reach surplus of. The, the omega-6 fat that we're producing is placed, um, and, and omega-9, is placed uh, in the subcutaneous fat. That's the one that seems to be most easily accessible to draw upon when you need but, energy. Yeah, but even people that aren't fat, even people that aren't overweight, that's they have fat stuck to their skin. When you lift the skin, that's where the fat is. Yes, of course, they have visceral fat as well, but not to the same extent. And to me, that oh. is... Yeah, just like a, a blubber. All mammals do. It's just a question of how much of the of the skin has that subcutaneous fat lying under it. And instead of taking little deposits and making them deeper, we take those little deposits and making them broader, until the point where they almost are continuous. But you look at lean cadavers; they hardly have any. People who have who have been not eating very much toward the end of their life. I, I, Sorry, my career has been spent dissecting bodies, teaching anatomy. Um, you know, as people starve, that gets used up because that is the most accessible fat. Fat around the organs has other functions, and excess fat there could become more dangerous. But it's lubrication. It puts the kidneys in a pool of liquid oil so that they become cushioned against mechanical jarring. It puts the heart in a pool of oil so that it can move around inside that pericardial sac without friction. That fat you can't use up, it's the last to go. The subcutaneous fat is the first place you put extra fat, first place you take it away from. I think the, 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 the key point on fat, uh, from my perspective is, is the babies that, you know, infants are born with five times more subcutaneous fat than the chimpanzee, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the argument that it's it's something that's specifically needed for brain growth just seems to me it's a little bit convenient. I mean, you talk about just so stories and, and origin myths. I mean, this seems to me it's a it's a it's a convenient thing that our ancestors needed to have this special fat layer to, because of our great brain, but not the chimpanzees. It, it's it's a kind of a teleological story about you know, we were special. Why, why didn't chimpanzees have that same thing? The chimpanzee brain stopped growing shortly after birth. The human brain keeps growing for another year or two in size. We are born with the smallest ratio of newborn to adult brain size of, of any relative. So we need to keep supplying that brain as it continues to grow, expand. Or maybe, or maybe the brain continued to expand because the fat was there. I wish Steve Cunane was here because he gave a very good talk on that early on. And that's, I think that's his, uh, his argument against that. Uh, that, that. It's kind of the other way around, that the, 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 the brain growth is kind of an exaptation from uh, being fat. Anyone else got a point? We're, we're, running, we're, we're, we're going a bit late. <laughs> um, Bert, I'm really sorry. I hope, I hope you're managing to stay with us there. You know, it's, it's like what must be what half past 12 now in Tokyo. <laughs> so uh, has, has anyone got any more last burning questions and Simon? i just like to thank john for his talk and hope you'll join us again yes thank you it was my good pleasure yeah i'd like to echo that as well thank you very much and, and I, I you know it is astonishing the hostility that we get you know i mean I, uh, on social media like twitter if i ask hmm. a question i mean i asked jeremy De, jeremy de silver a question about his book and he blocked me just block immediate block and this is quite normal and uh, yeah. if you're a crazy aquatic ape person, you expect this sort of behavior. So it's to your great credit, John, that you actually talk to us as if we're real yeah. human beings. It's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, I, I enjoy these conversations. I've, I've enjoyed being invited to the conferences in, in Ghent and in London and so forth. And um, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure because I'm really interested in the process of science and how we formulate ideas and explore them. Yeah, and I, I just want to make make sure I get this on record. Elaine Morgan, uh, when I spoke to her in 1999, I interviewed her. 
at length and she said John Langdon's a really nice guy we <laughs> really like him he just doesn't get it <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I probably won't get it, but <laughs> it's a pleasure to have this conversation. Okay, thank you. It's been a pleasure for me, and I hope everyone. So yeah. thank you very much. Uh, with yeah, next thank week, you, John. We've, we've hopefully got uh, Michael Crawford coming, uh, so that's the next speaker in a month's time. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you. Okay, uh, all the best.